Welcome to this special Tuesday, September 6, 2022 session of the Lake Forest City Council. Will the deputy clerk, oh, the city clerk, please call the roll. Honorable Mayor Candelion. Here. Alderman Morris. Here. Alderman Novit. Here. Alderman Rommel. Here. Alderman Notes. Here. Alderman Peschlein. Here. Alderman Gashgarian. Here. Alderman Here. Alderman Here. Mr. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you, Biddy. Uh, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Bless you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you all for joining us. The first item on the uh, agenda tonight is comments by the mayor. Uh, and um, I guess I should wish everybody, or hope everybody had a good Labor Day weekend. Uh, summer is officially over, and everybody's back in school, and we had the Deer Path Art Fair, and uh, the next thing is sort of the first big event of fall, which is the bagpipes and bonfire. So along with all the other uh, events that we have going on in town, we'll be hearing more about that tonight, I'm sure. Um, just, again, an example of what a, what a fabulous place this is to live. Um, on a bit of a sad note, uh, in the last 10 days or so, we've lost two of our most influ influential and important and generous citizens uh, in Carl Nagel and Sue Dixon. And at a future meeting, we will be uh, recognizing them, uh, but both have made massive contributions to this community in their lifetimes and uh, will be very hard to, uh, to replace. Uh, it fills shoes, very large shoes to fill. So um, we extend our condolences to their families and um, uh, we'll do something more formal at a subsequent meeting when we have uh, the appropriate amount of time. Uh, <clears throat> on the, uh, the next item on the agenda is comments by the city manager, uh, Jason. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor and members of City Council. Good evening. I have two items tonight. First, for our community spotlight, I'm pleased to bring back, as uh, you alluded to, uh, Mr. Mayor, one of Lake Forest's most uh, cherished and certainly well-supported institutions, and that's Lake Forest Open Lands Association. I think it's been almost two years now, or maybe about a year and a half, since we've last had them back for their community spotlight. And uh, as you will see, we have both uh, a new and uh, familiar face uh, to introduce. Ryan London is the new president of Lake Forest Open Lands, albeit a very familiar face. Ryan's been with Open Lands for, I believe, more than 20 years now. So really happy to have him to introduce himself to the council and to the community uh, to the degree he needs any introduction. And he's here with us tonight to share information about some current happenings and future initiatives with the association. So with that, Ryan, happy to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jason. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm Ryan London, President of Lake Forest Open Lands, and on behalf of our Board of Governors, our, my talented staff, and our dedicated volunteers, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to provide our community with an update on Lake Forest Open Lands. Though it is great to see all the familiar faces this evening, there are so many new neighbors in town that I'd like to take this opportunity to share a little bit about who I am and why I've dedicated my career at this amazing organization. Just last month, our summer internship program celebra celebrated its 25th class of participants, now having trained over 160 current and future conservation leaders. Pound for pound, this program delivers one of the best opportunities in our nation for college students to apply their studies within a community that is steeped in conservation values. And this remarkable program is how my story at Lake Forest Open Lands began. Sponsored by the Lake Forest Garden Club, I was one of three participants accepted to this position in the summer of 1999, an experience that forever changed my life. My eyes were opened to the power of a community that champions nature. 
whether it was the grace that Margie Hart showed me by walking me over to the Lake Forest Open Lands offices when I accidentally showed up at her art studio, <laughs> or the breathtaking tour of McCormick Ravine that Jamie Field provided me on my second day, I've carried the passion of this community's support of Lake Forest Open Lands in my heart during my career here, and I've loved working with our many partners like the Lake Forest Garden Club in the city of Lake Forest as we continue to sow the seeds of interest in our special wild places. At Lake Forest Open Lands, we believe that nature needs us just as much as we need nature. And this evening, my intent is to tell you how easy it is and to show you how good it feels to experience the mindset that we call Think Outside. As an independently funded conservation and education organization, we are devoted to preserving and stewarding our incredible local natural landscapes and ensuring that all are welcome and able to fully experience nature. For 55 years, it's been our privilege to engage and expand our community's commitment to nature, working with some of the rarest ecosystems found in the entire upper Midwest. We are thrilled to have preserved over 900 acres of savanna, prairie, wetlands, and ravines. And over the last six decades, the active support and guidance from our community has allowed us to grow from an all-volunteer organization to a full-time staff of 13, becoming the first Illinois Conservation Land Trust to achieve national accreditation in 2009 and have uh, been reaccredited twice since. Answering the call to action on conservation issues with innovative solutions has been a core organizational value since the beginning. Our start was as a group of concerned neighbors witnessing the loss of prairie and decline in water quality of our local streams. But as we worked to solve these problems and began to develop models for conservation and test those programs, we have shared those lessons learned and through partnerships <coughs> exported the think outside mindset and our approach to community conservation and education around the region and beyond. I eagerly invite everyone here and watching at home to come join us in at least one of our complimentary events and programs this year and wear your Lake Forest Open Lands hat as a badge of honor for being a part of something that was started before the very first Earth Day. We truly see our community as one big connected matrix of habitats. The plants, the birds, the insects, the animals, they don't recognize property lines. And even though our preserves function as a 900 acre strategic floodwater sponge. When we receive rain events like we had last July, the community-wide function and what we ask of nature is especially palpable. We are increasingly finding that nature already has valuable answers, and I believe that when we think outside, we can unlock those answers together while building capacity and resiliency for the future. 86% of the land in the United States is privately owned and 80% of the U.S. population lives within a major metropolitan area. If we're gonna to work together with nature on the challenges we face with climate change, water quality, habitat loss for the pollinators that we need for food, then community conservation models like ours here in Lake Forest are indeed the solution. Northeast Illinois and our part of the county in particular has the highest density of rare and unique species found within the entire state. And this is demonstrated by the fact that Lake Forest Open Lands has three soon to be five dedicated Illinois nature preserves, the highest level of land protection in the state. And it's offered um, through a years long lengthy process only available to the most critical habitats. We are truly blessed to have this natural fabric as the market to work within, but it is the proven think outside mindset that is the enterprise that has and will continue to allow us to make the necessary progress. So here are a few ways for our residents, both new and old, to experience Think Outside. Lake Forest Open Lands offers community engagement opportunities for all, from toddlers to elders, for those who prefer learning in the classroom, to those who prefer time in the field, and for those who like to block out their calendars months in advance, or those who like pop-up events. There's truly something for everyone. And our six, soon to be nine nature preserves are open 365 days a year with over 16 miles of trails for all to enjoy and entirely funded by memberships donations without the need for any local tax dollars. With the opening of the Jean and John Green Nature Preserve at McCormick Ravine, soon every ward in Lake Forest will have a Lake Forest Open Lands Nature Preserve within walking distance of their front, yard, front door. 
In addition to making sure the special places and wild spaces remain forever open for all to explore, we provide the opportunity to bring nature's benefits home. Stop by our conservation campus at the corner of Deer Path and Waukegan and check out our Mariani landscape designed demonstration garden. Pop into our office for your complimentary membership gift and stay for a sunset in one of our Adirondack chairs on the terrace. We host a spring plant sale every May and this year's fall tree sale is Saturday, October 29th. Pre-sale is live already on our website. We host year-round activities and events for community members to learn about what is happening in the preserve and enjoy a family outing in nature. Next week, we will resume our seasonal weekly guided hikes, bird watching lessons, and of course, all are welcome anytime to walk, play, and embrace a quiet moment in nature. Our newest endeavor is bringing the first all-access track-driven wheelchair to Illinois available for anyone to use, free of charge. We believe it is our duty to ensure nature is available to all, and this exciting new opportunity will bring community members who haven't been able to back to the preserves. This completely silent chair will be reservable through, through our website starting next month, and it is user-friendly to either self-drive or be driven by a caretaker walking behind. We have approached the new trails, bridges, boardwalks at the Gene and John Green Nature Preserve at McCormick Ravine with the same goal of inclusivity. These are all access trails and for the first time ever, someone in a self-propelled wheelchair will be able to experience McCormick Ravine. Stay tuned to our website for two special opportunities in November for a behind the scenes tour and a conservation cocktails presentation on November 11th on the story of our process and our award-winning national design team behind this community first. Our next monthly conservation cocktails is this Friday and local mushroom expert Meredith Swenka will talk about our amazing local mushrooms. These monthly programs are the second Friday of every month and are a great opportunity to get to know our staff and our partners and learn about an exciting occurrence in the preserves. We have now hosted over 68 thousand students across several generations in our education programs. It is our honor to connect nature with the hearts and minds of our community's young ones from all local schools and beyond. From, and our engagement staff and volunteers are looking forward to the start of our fall programming. Lake Forest Open Lands offered a special boat building workshop this summer for middle and high school age students. Building a boat is a fun and powerful way to build confidence and develop STEM skills, our seasoned instructors from, the, from Cincinnati's Camping and Education Foundation guided us through the process of building a 15-foot skin-on-frame canoe from scratch and two paddles as well. And we produced a beautiful, seaworthy canoe. In 2023, led by Lake Forest Open Lands, several organizations in Lake Forest will be presenting a wide variety of events that celebrate the history, culture, and contributions of Native Americans to our community, entitled Native Voices, the year-long programming will illuminate the legacy and current life of Native communities as we traverse thousands of years of history, covering their rich fabric of art, stewardship, environment, culture, and communication. <clears throat> On the land, our amazing volunteers generously donate over 6,000 hours a year to help out wherever they can, and they self-titled their, their group air which is adventures in restoration our talented team of ecologists and volunteer partners host two work days every week for adults and on the first saturday of every month we host our eco crew, crew work days which are excellent for families whatever your interest or involvement there is something for everyone and our focus truly is on delivering on the everyone part as i mentioned before our community has provided the brain trust of innovation all along for our organization's history. Much like the tradition of service within our city's boards and committees, I welcome and encourage anyone interested in assisting us to email us, call us, tag us in a social media post, and we will plant you right where you belong. September in Lake Forest means the final goodbye to summer and the start of fall as we host our annual fundraiser, Bagpipes and Bonfire, taking place on Sunday, September 25th from 4 to 7 p.m. at Middle Fork Farm Preserve. This year's event chairs are Elizabeth and Shelby Pruitt, this one-of-a-kind, multi-generational family favorite 
event invites our entire community to join us for live music, the Highland athletes, the Highland dancers, field games, and much more. The evening draws to a close with the 100 Piper procession, followed by the lighting of the bonfire. We hope you will all join us. Tartan's optional. Tickets may be purchased on our website. And we could not do any of these things without all of you, our members, our donors, our partners and volunteers are the spark that still keeps me excited on the way to the office every day for the last 20 years. As I alluded to before, nature knows no boundaries. From your yards to our trails, there's a group that would like to thank you if they could. The other Lake Forest residents that were here long before us. In closing, Gregory Bateson famously said, the major problems of the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and how people think. One solution for bridging those problematic differences is to steward and cultivate what is known academically as ecological literacy, which is a fancy way to say, think outside. And it's inspiring to think about the true potential of those two words. I know I quickly scratched the surface on how to discover all the ways that each of you can connect with Lake Forest Open Lands and I hope that you were able to feel the warm and welcoming culture that I've experienced during my tenure here. Now, as the fifth person to lead this amazing organization, I look forward to serving our entire community and with my amazing team, continue our local tradition of ensuring future generations will always have access to the prairies, savannas, ravines, and streams to explore and experience. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, an amazing organization, and uh, I think we all benefit enormously from it. So uh, if there are members of the council that have questions for Ryan or thoughts or anything they'd like to talk about. Ryan, could, you bring up the first, I'm sorry. could you please bring up that first slide with the map? Sure. Is that possible? <coughs> I just was curious, you commented that each ward will have the opportunity to you know, experience open lands and preserves right outside their doorstep. And yep, the map. Yep. Can you tell me West Fork, Savannah? Wh where is what is that off of? What street? West Fork. That is off of Half Day Road, uh, in unincorporated Lake County. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's our newest preserve. <clears throat> is that where you're still looking to do a bike trail that comes up uh, through that uh, area? We are looking to apply all of our traditional preserve infrastructure approaches out there, including restoration, community engagement. We've already got some local school groups out there, as well as the recreational opportunities. Yeah. And, and Ryan, again, thank you very much for your presentation, your involvement, and for stepping in the shoes of uh, John Centel. Uh, I know they're big shoes, but uh, you're doing a wonderful job filling those shoes. Uh, one other question on uh, McCormick Ravine. Any timeline for that? Sure. So luckily our engineer is in the audience. I don't want to put him on the spot, but we are at um, probably a critical path delivering the infrastructure complete in early November and then give, us, give ourselves a couple weeks to get any bugs out and hopefully an opening to the public this year. Uh, we might have some planting and you know some of the soft sprucing up that we might need to do in the spring um, but yeah I think oh, we'll that's, that's great if you're looking well. for this year uh, an opening well, hopefully you're successful in doing doing that uh, we are under great leadership between Hay and Kino and all the partners involved out there mm -hmm. great other questions or comments okay thank you. thank you very much Ryan and congratulations on your elevation <laughs> Great, thank you, Ryan. Uh, next under my report, I have a brief presentation from our uh, Superintendent of Parks and Forestry, Chuck Myers. Included in tonight's omnibus agenda is request for approval for the Forest Park Beach Restoration Project. The council may recall that uh, this is uh, a project <coughs> in a, for which the city undertook pretty significant engineering design about a year ago in the face of increasing erosion challenges down at the beach. 
in the first step uh, I, or solution identified as part of that process was sand replenishment at the beach. And certainly we recall through some of our uh, budget and capital workshops that the council and the community took interest in the types of sand being utilized as part of that replenishment process. So I've asked Chuck to just give a very brief update uh, as to what is being requested tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Alder or sorry. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the council. Um, as City Manager Wisha mentioned, this is on the omnibus, so I'm just going to hit it at the high level. Um, we've had discussions of the beach many times, and a couple of years ago, I told you that it was at a record high level. Um, and the good news is it is down right now about two foot from that level. Um, so it is a very good time for us to be starting this work uh, to make sure that when the water level goes back up and it will go back up at some point, um, we will be better situated to prevent further erosion there. Um, so this was uh, part of the capital plan, um, and it was budgeted at 325000 for the design and the construction. Um, we did uh, do the study last year. This was the result. It was part of the uh, study that identified the long-term monitoring and maintenance plan. This was the first step, and there's a number of other steps in future years. And I will tell you that we continue to look at that. Um, it is in the CIP, um, but as new technology, new ideas come around, um, we're staying on top of that. So um, this year though, uh, the, the, the priority was sand replenishment, also called sand nourishment, you'll hear it called. Um, but this, this project uh, relates to cell one, the northernmost cell. Um, it is the area that's most depleted of sand um, from those high water level years with storms. So, um, and it is the one that is at risk, uh, particularly to winter storms. So it is important that we address it this fall. We would like to have it in place. Uh, so the project includes uh, the placement of 4,850 cubic yards of sand uh, in, in cell one. That is 52% uh, uh, torpedo, I'm sorry, yeah, torpedo sand and 48%, um, there's a little moth flying around here, sorry, I'm not <laughs> waving at you. <laughs> so, so it is a mix, as, as uh, City Manager Wisha mentioned. Um, we did hear your concerns with uh, with the sand and the texture of the sand, particularly for the beach users, we do realize that the, uh, the sand that has the best protection against erosion is the bird's eye. However, it's not the most user friendly. So we did hire a, uh, an engineering firm uh, to help us with that. And they, they came up with a design. I'm not gonna go into this in any depth, but um, this is the profile. Um, so as you come down the hill and you see the rocks along the road, those, the revetment stone, some of that would be covered with right here is bird's eye. And then there'd be about 35 feet of beach that would have the torpedo sand. So that's the main place where people do play. Then out in the, in the water, there would be the addition of more bird's eye. So it's kind of a, a hybrid approach to try to get the best of both. Um, we will um, be having a company segregate these as they're putting them in and do the best they can to keep these uh, areas uh, separate. Uh, so that will equate to about uh, 240 truckloads of sand that will be brought in. Uh, it will require the closure of the North Beach Access Road while the heavy trucking is going on. It's expected that if they get continuous work on it. It should be two weeks to complete the project. Uh, they won't be working on the weekend, so the North Beach Access Road would be open all that time. There won't be any storage in the parking lots or anything like that, so when they're not trucking, it will be open to residents to use. Um, but we can't have the trucks coming down the road and have cars trying to get out at the same time. It would be a dangerous situation. Um, so uh, permitting is currently underway. Uh, it's a long process. We started it in January. We're still waiting. Uh, it is Army Corps and IDNR. 
IDNR works with the uh, IEPA, and they did go through the whole public, public process. There were no public concerns or anything like that, so we're now waiting. We're anticipating it being here by the end of the month, uh, but it is, those are some major <laughs> entities, as you know, they don't always do things as quick as we'd like. Um, so with that, um, we did go out to bid last month. We received two proposals, one from John Kino and company. They have done a lot of work at the beach in the past. Uh, they gave us a proposal of 258,363 and then the other bid was from Misfits Construction and they were at 277,300. This was very close to the, the estimate, the engineer's estimate, so we were happy with the cost. Um, we are recommending going forward with that. Uh, this did go to the city or to the uh, public works committee, and they are also recommending that this move forward. Uh, and all the rest of the information is there, but uh, I can answer any questions that you might have. Um, since we represent Ward One, um, the 240 trucks are going to come. What what's the route that they're going to take? Uh, that's a good question for our engineering staff. I don't have it memorized. It's the standard one that we have for our, a lot of our projects. I don't know. I hate to put Byron on the spot. I don't have it. Uh, this is a Michael Thomas. Like, he rattles this off all the time. Well, I think if you the could... Route, the route to get in and out. I can certainly well, get it to you. It's in the bid documents. Just, yeah, we need to get it publicized in, yes, the, yep, in, yep. in all the different right. venues. We're going to do notifications to the, the people on the route. And it sounds like it would be the beginning of October that this yep. would take off. Yeah, as long as we have the permit, we can't start till we have that, but we'd like to start in October. We planned it that way, not just because of the permit, but also we wanted the beach to, to start going down in use. So it could be as late as November. <laughs> if it, it, we just like to have it done by the end of December. Mm -hmm. okay. To your point, Alderman Morris, we'll clarify the route and, yep. and publicize it to the community. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Any other questions? Alderman Romo? So uh, I know that when we looked at this total project, there was some dune plantings mm -hmm. and uh, native grasses that were going in. Where is that on the to-do list? Uh, yeah, the, the design for that is this current year, so this fiscal year, and then we would like to do the plantings next year. We're also keeping our eye open for grant possibilities. It does lend itself to that kind of thing. So uh, design this year, which is not complete, and then implementing it next year. And did that design go further than just sell one? I think it did, didn't it? They did show areas along the beach near the groins that were going to be um, armored. However, that first phase is just north of cell one. That's where we were planning on starting. No, I know, but in the, in the plantings I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, the plantings were... would just be north of cell one. Okay, yeah. all right. And the other question I have, I know when we did the Big Beach project, uh, we wound up redoing the parking lot because of all of the heavy trucks that were brought in. Are, are we having that same concern with this project? Uh, no, we're not. It is a fairly new parking lot. Um, we are going to make sure that the edges are protected um, with um, mats that will make sure that the edges aren't <coughs> busted, but the road itself uh, should not have any impact. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Chuck. All right. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That concludes my report for this evening. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next thing on the agenda is um, an opportunity for citizens to address the council on non-agenda items. I see a couple of people in the audience that, uh, and we have one. Uh, 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 slip that's been submitted uh, to uh, comment on the synth synthetic turf uh, fields at Deer Path, which we're going to talk about later. So uh, I'll take some time for public comment at that time on that subject because that's an agenda item. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak to the council on a non-agenda item? Okay. Uh, seeing none. <coughs> The next item on the agenda is items for omnibus vote consideration. And we have 11 items tonight. 
First, uh, approval of the August 1st, 2022 City Council meeting minutes. Second, approval of the check register for the period of July 23rd through August 26th, 2022. Third, approval of an 18-month contract extension with Lake Forest Bank and Trust for Banking Services. Four, consideration of a request to waive the fidelity bond requirement in connection with holding a raffle in the City of Lake Forest for the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Chamber of Commerce. Uh, that's an approval by motion. Uh, fifth, approve the pur purchase of, uh, com of the complete system that includes body-worn cameras, squad car mobile video systems, Taser 7 tasers, and a cloud-based digital evidence management software included in the fiscal year 2023 capital equipment budget from the National Source Well Low Bidder, Axon, in the amount of $120,395. That, by the way, is a state-required project. Uh, sixth, award of a purchase for bulk purchase of mobile diesel efficient fuel to the Suburban Purchasing Cooperative, uh, low bidder, Al Warren Oil, Inc. <clears throat> Seventh, approval of a resolution committing local funds for the 2022 Illinois Transportation Enhancement Program for the Deer Path Road Streetscape Project grant application and the authorization of the city manager to execute related grant application documents. Eighth, approval of a Public Works Committee recommendation of an award of bid to Bruce Brugioni Construction Company for the Eloa and City Hall Tuck Pointing and Eloa Garden Wall Repair Project in the amount of $115,279 to include a 10% contingency in the amount of $11,600 for a grand total of $126,879. Ninth, consideration of a resolution of authorization for an OSLAD grant program project at South Park. Tenth, approval of a recommendation from the Pub Public Works Committee to award a contract to John Keno and Company for the Forest Park uh, Beach Restoration Project in the amount of $258,363 plus 4% contingency in the amount of $10,000 for a total of $268,363. Eleventh, consideration of requests for waivers of city-related fees to supporting special events organized by the School of St. Mary Parent Organization and the Deer Path Art League. That's an approval by motion. Uh, is there any item that anybody on the City Council would like removed or taken separately? Alderman Bushman. I'd like to ask a question about one of the items, if I may. Okay. It'd be item five, uh, where, uh, as you mentioned, Mayor, there's a uh, requirement now for body cameras to be worn by enforcement officers. And uh, in the write-up, it indicates that the uh, implementation uh, under the law needs to be done by January 1, 2025. I'm wondering if, uh, we, if uh, the chief uh, could share with us a timeline uh, for when he feels uh, we would be implementing uh, body cameras. Uh, in our police force. I can, thank you. We expected some supply chain constraints in ordering and we really wanted to build in some cushion so that if anything went wrong, we were sure to meet that 2025 deadline, January 1 of 2025. It'll probably, we're anticipating now six to 12 months until we have every single piece of equipment listed in your write-up in hand, troubleshooted and installed and in use. I assume some training will go with that uh, for the officers. Absolutely. And obviously, there's been a lot of experience out there uh, that we've seen on the news, and uh, that will be helpful, I assume, too. Right. Uh, we've had squad car cameras for quite some time. Obviously, this will be our fourth generation. We started with VHF uh, cameras about 26 years ago, so we're, we're pretty good with those. But the body cams will be a big adjustment, um, both acclimating to the statute as well as policy. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, any other questions or comments? In that case, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Seconded. Okay. A roll call vote, please. Alderman Notes. Aye. You say notes or notes? Notes. notes. Aye. Alderman <laughs> <laughs> Notes. Uh, Alderman Fred Fleck. Aye. Alderman Gosh Garriott. Aye. Alderman Bushman. Aye. Alderman Weber. Aye. Alderman Morris. Aye. Alderman Aye. Alderman Rommel. Aye. 8 yeas, 0 nays. Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Uh, now the next item on the agenda is old business, uh, which uh, in this case is a status report and uh, seeking some direction from the council on the development and discussion to date on the design options for synthetic turf fields at Deer Path Community Park. I'm gonna turn it over to City Manager Wisha for a little further explanation of where things stand and then uh, a little presentation. So. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mayor. And uh, again, good evening, Council. As the Mayor alluded to, really the intent of tonight's discussion is to do a check-in, if you will, with the City Council as we're nearing the 50% completion mark in the design work <coughs> for the Deer Path Park Athletic Fields Improvement Project. It's a little unusual um, to have uh, a check-in with the council at a midpoint in engineering design, but given the magnitude of the project, we thought it was important to update the council and the community as to where things stand, and importantly, to provide an update on some of the recommendations that are coming out of the city manager advisory group that was formed earlier this year. I've asked uh, Superintendent uh, of Parks and Forestry, Chuck Myers, to pro prepare a presentation to walk through with you the three recommendations that have come forward to date from the advisory committee. Two of those, uh, a review of uh, an overall uh, conceptual vision or master plan for the site, as well as uh, um, discussing the criteria being used to evaluate different plain uh, materials or products are really intended just to get a sense from the council tonight informally as to whether we're on the right path and going in the right direction. And so we seek your feedback uh, after the presentation. The third item, we're looking for a little more formal direction from the council, and that is specific to the plane size of the overall athletic fields themselves. You'll recall when this was last discussed amongst the council that the council directed staff to look at two different sized playing fields in terms of the overall dimensions or footprint uh, of the fields themselves. The advisory group working with city staff and the project consultants have evaluated two different options and we intend to walk through that with you tonight and seek feedback and direction <coughs> on which option the council wants to direct staff and the project consultants to complete design work on. So we look for clarity from you on that. Beyond that, I would just remind the council and the public that again, we're only at about the 50% completion mark for design work. So there is a lot of work still to be done. There are no funding consideration uh, decisions that need to be made tonight. That won't happen until probably late fall and early winter after the design work is complete. As the council knows, and, and I think has been conditioned to in our capital planning processes, <laughs> We strategically complete design work before we begin uh, construction funding discussions so that we have a more accurate uh, estimate as to what the cost will be for the project. So once that design work is completed, then we will come back to council to have a more comprehensive discussion on funding. But for the purpose of understanding the various options in field sizes, there are some preliminary cost estimates that will be shared with you tonight. So before I turn it over to Chuck, I just want to conclude by extending my sincere thanks and appreciation to the uh, advisory committee. It is a, a process that has worked to great success in the past for large scale public improvement or other community projects in this community. And I think uh, the group that we have put together for this project has lived up to some of the lofty expectations uh, and accomplishments of past groups and is a testament again to the Lake Forest way of doing things and planning in a thoughtful and long-term way for projects of this magnitude. And so I see our chair of the advisory group, Prue Beidler, is in attendance. And, and so I just want to, on behalf of the city staff in particular, thank her and the group that she uh, so successfully led in helping get us to this point. Uh, no question that the project and the design process has been improved as a result of their contributions to the discussion. And so with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Chuck and let him walk through the recommendations that have been developed to date. All right. Um, 
we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, I am not going to spend a lot of time on the history. Uh, uh, you know that last year we spent a fair amount of time uh, with some of the community engagement and the meetings that we had that pursued from that. But um, start going back to April. Uh, that's when City Council approved the recommendation from the Park and Rec Board. Uh, in support of the improvement of the athletic, athletic fields at Deerpath Park. Um, and it was also when City Council authorized us to do the request for proposal uh, for the design services. And then in May, we came back to you uh, and you awarded a, uh, the approval of a contract with <coughs> Hitchcock and uh, their extended team uh, for architectural and engineering services. Um, with the uh, consideration uh, for overall size and the incorporation of sustainable practices. So that's the last time we were here and we're excited to tell you that it, it's been uh, four months now and we've got an incredible team working on this, both our staff and the consultants. Um, it's a very large group working on this. We have uh, eight staff members that um, were uh, put on a team to look at this and then beyond them they have other members of their team So there's a, a large effort going into this um, in addition um, As I mentioned we hired Hitchcock. They have a team of two engineering firms Primera and Hay and Associates uh, and they have a, a building architecture firm a construction management firm all dedicated to getting us where we are today. And as city manager Wisha mentioned, we are just at 50%. It's hard to believe. It's, it's, um, we have uh, found out a lot in that process. Uh, keep in mind, you all know that this is the first time we've done that, this kind of a project, and we're all learning. Um, but I am really impressed with the staff, the consultants, all the effort that's gone in to date has been remarkable. So uh, I hope uh, I can convey this well and uh, let you know a little bit more tonight about um, some of the things that we've been looking at. Um, so with those staff teams, we did divide into various different areas to focus on, uh, one being the, the basic design, then a second one being the environmental sustainability factors. Then we looked at programming, field programming, uh, traffic and parking improvements, uh, and then the ongoing maintenance requirements for the site. So teams have been devoted to each one of that. We come together on a regular basis uh, to keep this process going forward. Um, so I, I did mention the, the uh, Hitchcock team. I, I will say tonight we have with us a couple of people from Hitchcock, Steve Conters. He's the senior principal, uh, and then Lacey Lawrence is the uh, principal associate designer. Uh, and then also uh, with Hayne Associates, uh, you've probably seen Dave here before for other things, but Dave is uh, the principal uh, civil engineer with Hayne Associates. So there's also members of our city staff team here. There's a number of them. I won't uh, call them all out, but um, a remarkable group, I can assure you. So um, with that, uh, the next thing that happened was uh, the formation of the advisory group. So city manager uh, advisory group was formed, bringing together community experts in a variety of disciplines to offer guidance and expertise to city staff and the consulting team. The group advised, they challenged, they offered insights, and they made recommendations to city staff uh, as well. They provided comments and input on the site design, field products uh, for two uh, size fields, the 7.6 and the 9.5 acre configurations. They also provided recommendations on site design, field products, and field size. So those are the recommendations that were mentioned earlier, and we'll definitely be going back to those. Uh, so tonight, we are focused on the design and programming. <clears throat> We've been working with traffic and parking. We've been looking at maintenance and all those things, but that is not the focus uh, for us tonight. Um, and just to mention, we, did, we have had three meetings to date with the advisory group. The first one was the kickoff back in May, shortly after 
our team was formed. Uh, we met with them to get them up to speed on the project, but also to introduce them to some of the site uh, evaluation that was being done. Uh, the second meeting uh, was a focus on the layout for both the 7.6 acre and the 9.5 acre designs. Uh, our design team, the consultant team, was at 30% at that point, so it was a good time for them to weigh in on the options of these different sizes. Um, knowing that ultimately we'd be coming here to have that discussion with you, so that was a critical point. The final meeting was just last month in August, and it was when we were at 50% design, which is where we're at right now. And at that meeting, we focused on the field size recommendations and a review of the field products and the evaluation criteria that we used as we looked at those. Uh, with that, um, based on their input and their expertise, um, this is what the advisory recommendation uh, group is recommending. So you have those up on the screen. Um, but I, I will just highlight them. The advisory group prefers a 9.5 acre synthetic athletic field layout. Second, the advisory group agrees with the criteria that the city staff is using to evaluate options for turf field materials and that the overall cost of the project goals, or goals, I'm sorry, the overall project goals are player safety, playability, maintenance, durability, and environmental sensitivity. We clearly heard the concerns that were expressed by the community and by city council. That has been the lens that we've looked at from day one on this. We have tried to um, spend the time and energy to seek out those kind of solutions uh, to the pro not only the products, but also the different options that you'll see tonight. Um, and then the final uh, one was that the advisory group was charged with dreaming big, and you'll see they lived up to that. There are some things um, that uh, I think were um, great big ideas, and we told them to do that without regard for cost. We didn't talk cost at that time. We said merely that we need to dream big, um, that eventually someone will decide how much we're willing to sp uh, spend, which will fall on you at some point, but um, for tonight, we're not gonna talk about all of those different features, um, but we are gonna give you, we're gonna um, show you the conceptual plan that we've uh, created. So the field improvements should be considered in the context of both the short term, that's what we're doing tonight, uh, looking at what you've charged us with doing, the synthetic turf on the area of the ball fields, um, but it also should be looked at with a long-term uh, perspective for opportunities. So that conceptual vision plan is kind of the bigger picture that we, we ask them to dream about. Um, so it does um, take, it did take the opportunity to look at what could be uh, and looks beyond the scope of what we were really uh, focused on with the artificial turf. Um, recognizing that elements of the plan could be developed over time, they could be phased in or incrementally acted upon in future years. So um, we also recognize that it could be that um, these would require uh, public or private funding um, in addition to public funds as well. So again, as City Manager Wisha mentioned, we're not looking for any action on that tonight. We're not going to be presenting any more than just a, a brief overview of some of those options. And then we'll focus on the layouts. So the conceptual plan, uh, this, is, this is where we ask them to dream big. Um, I know um, this is the first time that you've seen this and there's a lot of detail on there. Um, I'm just gonna give a high level um, look at this. Uh, I'll point to a few things, but um, as you can see, when I'm referring to the core project, it's down in here. Uh, so to start, we did look at parking changes in this area. And again, this is based on the idea that in the future, uh, there may be improvements that require more parking. So as you can see, this is expanded. Currently, there's a tennis court here. Uh, there's 
playground and basketball courts over here. Um, that is all parking in this concept. And to accommodate that, we've moved the tennis courts and pickleball up here and a PlayStation and basketball courts up in the corner. Uh, so this is currently lawn area right now. Um, if, if things like this were to occur in the future, it would require likely detention, more stormwater detention. That's what this area is designated as. Not a pond, but an area that can uh, take on stormwater. Um, also, Hastings Road was um, changed. As you know, it, um, my hand's not that steady, but it com comes down like this currently. We changed the configuration to cut along through the school there. There's also uh, improvements mentioned with turn lanes and things like that. Again, we're not going to talk a lot about traffic or parking tonight. I'm just giving you the overview. We have met with the school, uh, the superintendent. We're keeping them aware of these um, ideas as well to see where, they're, uh, where they land on it. So we'll continue to have those discussions as well. Um, so that's parking and traffic. Um, in addition, identify this area on this end as a potential site for a large inflatable dome. Uh, this was something that was brought up during the, uh, the advisory group meetings. Uh, it was something that was intriguing uh, to uh, seem like everyone on the group. It was something that they thought we needed to look further into. It would provide year-round uh, indoor space with artificial turf again um, that could be used for events, sporting activities, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, we didn't spend a lot of time on this. It was a bit far reaching for our discussion of this area, um, but we did recognize that uh, the group was interested in at least having further discussions. We did put it in an area that would allow us flexibility as we go forward with the primary core project. That's why it's up in here. It doesn't hinder anything that we're gonna talk about later tonight. It's merely a future uh, opportunity if the community decided to go that route. Um, so moving down, there is a, a building, an entrance building with a, uh, restrooms and a little pavilion here. On the south end, there's another restroom, a uh, walkway through the middle. Um, but on the west end, the, this is the floodplain area. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit tonight. We did hear loud and clear again uh, from the community. Um, you know, we do value those areas and dealing with stormwater was certainly a big part of our evaluation and working with our consulting team, particularly Hay and Associates focused a lot on this area, um, even looking at permitting and things like that. So there's a lot in this area that was considered. Um, for the most part, this is not buildable at all. Um, that is an area that we looked at improvements to the, the Skokie River, the bank, it's in pretty poor condition. We looked at rock outcroppings and cutting back the bank to make it better suited for detention. Uh, it is one of the few places that you could go to the Skokie River. We're seeing this area as a beautiful little nature area um, with native plantings, walkways, place where people can do bird watching, there could be educational programs, that kind of thing. A small boardwalk down here where it's a little bit wetter. This is a basically a detention basin that would be fully planted with native plants. Um, again, all part of the stormwater approach. And then walking paths throughout this. This spot here was slated for a maintenance shop that was identified throughout this process. Uh, is something that we would need uh, for, uh, for ma future maintenance of the site. Uh, so then the, the overall field here, I'm going to have Dave come up and talk about that in a few minutes, and we're going to highlight that. Um, I'm going to focus on, on just the overall plan. This side was meant to be a uh, play area, basically. So you had a shelter-type building there. Uh, you have a playground, and then you have some fitness equipment. 
Um, all because one of the things that was clear to our advisory group that we talked about was whether or not this is an athletic complex or a community park. And it was agreed that this is a community park and as such, it should serve the community as a whole. So that's why some of those features were incorporated into this. Um, so we did also, one thing I will mention on the overall field, we did look at it as lifting it a foot to get it up out of the 100 year floodplain. So that that is, these are a couple things that did drive things up. We heard you loud and clear that we wanted to address some of those issues. To do that, we've, had, we've taken a really deep dive with the engineering to figure out how to best do that. And there are a lot of solutions to this. Um, as you look at this plan, I will tell you that this is the last view that our advisory group looked at. Since then, engineering has determined that we could stay out of the floodplain um, by moving the turf fields to the east. So that renders this out of the project. So it is something we'd like to do, but if we move it to the east, we would lose this area. It's not to say that we couldn't try to find other areas for these type structures, uh, but it'll be a bit challenging when we lose that area. We don't really want to put anything like a playground in that on the west side. We're trying to keep that uh, fairly natural. So in the diagram that Steve is going to go through, you'll see that everything is shifted. The costs are considerable. If we don't shift it to the east, it, as much as $2 million change just for mitigation, because we'd be looking at under under like vaults like the uh, storm trap that's going on right now in Burr. That kind of thing would be required to manage that amount of water. So very expensive solutions. Then on top of that would be the cost of all the equipment. Um, so next, I do want to jump into the field size. Uh, so as we, the, as city manager Wisha mentioned, this is kind of the the big question for the night. Is it 7.6 or is it 9.5? Uh, so. To we wanted to ensure that the field size is appropriate for our community needs. We hired Johnson Consulting. Um, to, they, they are a, a company that provides strategic planning and, develop, and development advisory services for convention, hospitality, sports, real estate industries. Um, so we brought them in as soon as we could get them on board to help us have an independent look at this to determine what the best sizing is. So they worked in the end with our, the rest of our design team to give us their insights. Um, we brought them in to analyze the programming data from both the recreation programming, but also the private youth sports uh, organizations and guide us toward the recommendation of what size would be appropriate for our use. So based on that marketing assessment, Johnson Consulting determined the following recommendations, that the local character, and this is from their demographic study, that our local character is prime for a high utilization in youth sports programming. With above average youth population, that's the five to 24 year old demographic, there's been significant growth in youth and there's a strong market potential for high level sports facilities. They also recommend the larger 9.5 acre site will provide more fields and in turn allow for increased programming potential at the park. In addition, if more programming was consolidated at Deer Path from other parks that is, the larger field layout will provide more field hours to be absorbed into the park. So less pressure on other parks. Um, Johnson concluded that 9.5 was the right choice in their opinion um, and it isn't building excess extra capacity beyond what the community can expand. Um, they were pretty strong on that. They felt that 9.5 uh, was the right number for us. With that, I've asked uh, Steve to come up and give you an overview on some of the layouts of these, and it is both in, it's gonna start with 7.6 and then go into 9.5.
Thanks, Chuck, and good evening, Mayor and Alderman and Councilman. Um, so uh, just to sort of build upon then what, what Chuck was saying regarding the, the fields and what Johnson Consulting came about, what we're going to go over with you as a couple um, diagrams that show the difference between the 7.6 and 9.6 acre fields. So what we're really trying to represent here is the difference in flexibility that you have. While we're showing some specific layouts, these are by no means what you would be limited to, but these might sort of show sort of the wide ranges of what you could do from a standpoint of baseball, football, lacrosse, soccer, and other youth sports as well. And one of the other things that we came away with from the Johnson Consulting Report was an understanding that some of the, pro the most primary uses that you might see are those in sort of the, the U9 to U12 type multi-purpose size fields. So you're going to see quite a few examples that represent how those can fit across the different, different ideas. Um, as some of you may know, north-south, while it might be a preferred orientation for field layout, when you're talking about you know, sports in general and doing various games and practices, it's common to, to stripe them both north, south, and east, west to get as much flexibility as you can. So you're going to see combinations of those two types of orientations throughout these two field types. What you've got on the screen right now is the 7.6 acre field size. And so you'll notice that, you know, sort of from top left to bottom right, uh, all these are going to be representing that the baseball fields would be oriented so that the infields are toward the four corners facing inward, just like it is now. That provides us maximum amount of flexibility for how you can stripe and do other purpose, other multi-purpose fields within that sort of footprint. And so from your, what you're seeing here, you can get uh, quite a few sort of U9 to U12 um, multi-purpose fields. You can get a few large full size, whether it's soccer, lacrosse, or football fields in this particular way. One of the differences you're gonna see as we switch over to the 9.5 acre field size is while the, the baseball fields might remain the same, you're gonna see that you can start to get a, a larger number of, uh, of your other size fields striped various ways when you move to the larger footprint. The other thing that we'll note is a larger footprint that we're currently showing, and we'll talk about this a little bit further on the next slide, represents a concrete walk down the middle of that, which does not show up in the 7.6 acre version because of the fact that the, the, the 9.6 acre has more space where you can get that concrete walk in. We'll talk about what the benefits of that walk can be. But as you can see, even with that walk down the middle, you can still get a larger quantity number of fields and have more flexibility and sort of optimum field layouts with the larger field size as well here. The other thing to point out about the, uh, the larger uh, turf field footprint is that one of the things that you might notice looking back on the 7.6 field layout is a lot of these layouts are tight. They're right next to each other, not just from the plane lines, but sort of what we call the runout zone beyond that, where players can go beyond the line if they're chasing a ball, where you could set up players and fans to, for spectating and for operations. So in this, in this foot, smaller footprint, you have less space between fields to accommodate those type of operations. As you move on to the 9.5 acre field version, while you can do a larger quantity of fields, you can also gain a little bit more buffer space so that you could have more operational space for those kind of considerations. So from there, we kind of move on to, um, you know, focusing on the main area that Chuck had mentioned. So although, you know, right now we're kind of showing on the screen the, uh, the, the 9.5 acre version. The 9.5 acre is the turf space. So that does not include the concrete walk. It's all the turf space that you would have available in this footprint. Uh, part of the benefit of the concrete walk is that it provides more ADA access, you know, from north to south. While the project would have the loop trail, just like you have now, a loop trail going around the perimeter of the field, you know, that's sort of a long way for people to go to get from the north parking area down to some of the south fields. So this is a, a much more convenient and accessible route to the various fields. It also provides you space to get accessible seating and player, uh, player access. So if you are doing some striping of fields where people need to get to the center as opposed to the perimeter, it allows more ADA access for that, as well as setting up areas for player, uh, for fans to, to uh, view from there. So they're not just having to view from the perimeter or cross onto the field turf to view pr uh, middle games, but they have central viewing areas. And lastly, the other benefit that you get with the central walk is it provides sort of a, a, an infrastructure corridor where you can now put lighting. So the lighting isn't just around the perimeter of the field anymore, but now you can bring it to the center. And so you get a little bit more optimal lighting for those interior fields that might be um, played upon during evening hours. 
The other thing to point out on this too is as Chuck mentioned, um, the shifting of this. So this particular plan does show that idea of this footprint shifted over to the east, which is why you're not seeing those additional amenities on the east side, like the playground and the shelter area. By doing that, uh, the, you can see the dark blue line in sort of the lower left corner there. That represents the 100-year floodplain. So we st don't get completely out of it, but we get, more, it's, it's, we get more of the field out of it than what's in it without the shift. And so that's important for two reasons. The, the, more, the less that we are in the fl floodplain with the fields, especially since we need to raise their elevation to keep them out of that sort of that wet zone, then we, need, then we have more mitigation is required. So we need to do two things here, basically, from a stormwater perspective. We need to provide mitigation for the fill that we're doing in the floodplain, which is the filling, the raising of the fields, and we need to provide stormwater attention. And we're accomplishing that through really three things throughout this plan. We're accomplishing some of that mitigation in the, actually the stone base that's underneath the athletic surfacing, as well as a little bit of the work that's happening along the Skokie River that Chuck mentioned, where we're kind of taking what's already an eroded bank and kind of peeling that back a little bit and restabilizing it. Those two things get us some of the mitigation we need for having some fill within the floodplain. The stormwater is handled mostly through a combination of a little bit of the capacity that's also in the stone base, but also primarily what you'll see there on, the, you know, just directly west of the fields is that open basin area. And so by shifting of those fields, what you see is the dark green represents the basin limits approximately without the shift. You'll notice a bold black line that kind of represents the expansion that we can accomplish. So by shifting those fields east, we get more space on the west for more surface area for the detention. And that's what kind of Chuck alluded to, that without the shift, there could be a need for some, uh, some, under, some more expensive types of stormwater detention. Did you have a clarification, Dan? No. Okay. Um, so those, uh, you would still have those. So in this, what you're represented here is the, you get the 9.6 acre fields, you get the central walkway, the loop trail path, then the surface detention to the west, along with some little, a little bit of work outside the yellow box along the Skokie River for some of that mitigation we mentioned. You can see per, that uh, in this particular diagram, the buildings are outside of that, and that's going to be something that Chuck will talk about when he represents a little bit more about the budgeting. But was there anything else, Chuck, you want me to mention on that? All right. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, all right. So uh, we next want to get to the costs. So um, <coughs> the project is, again, at 50 percent. Uh, I know I've said that a few times, but uh, just to make sure you know that these are just estimates uh, and that they could change. Uh, so the, the estimate for the 7.6 acre configuration is $11 million, uh, and the 9.5 is an additional 1.5 for a total of 12.5 million. And again, this is shifted east. If we didn't shift it east, that 9.5 would be potentially another $2 million. So we felt it uh, appropriate to um, keep this is a responsible amount. Uh, we, we were asked uh, to start this project. We knew what numbers you had, um, so we thought it was reasonable to keep it uh, at that level. Um, the important thing to talk about now is what this does include and what it does not. So the turf products um, are inc included in this uh, that meet the uh, evaluation criteria that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, and it's important to note that a lot of the products that we looked at um, do meet or um, answer some of those environmentally sensitive uh, issues that were talked about. So they, they come at a cost. Um, a lot of the technology is changing um, and we were pleasantly surprised with some of the things that are out there. So a little bit more on that in a moment, but um, just so you know that that doesn't this price does include some of those products that do come at a, a higher cost. Uh, the second thing it includes is the elevated fields that I mentioned that approximately one foot lift um, to pull it out of the floodway, the 100 year uh, line, the walking path that goes around the entire uh, fields is also included in this site lighting uh, is included. Uh, the dugouts, backstops, bleachers, scoreboard, safety netting, all of that is included in these numbers. 
uh, sports and maintenance equipment. So things like um, the equipment that we manage uh, or uh, maintain the turf with, uh, but also goals and things like that. Uh, and then the utilities for the three buildings that were mentioned previously. And then the west site natural areas and detention improvements. So that's what's included. What's not included in this cost estimate are the building structures. We are going forward with the design of two buildings, uh, the, the, the north and south bathroom. That was in the original contract with Hitchcock and their team, so that will continue, but those estimate, that is not in this estimate. Um, and as noted above, we are putting in the estimate for having the utilities to those buildings in case it is deemed necessary to, or uh, desired to put in those buildings. The second thing it does not improve, uh, include is improvements uh, north of the field, all of those things that I mentioned earlier with parking lots and domes and all that. Of course, none of that is included in this. Um, other amenities, the play sets, as I mentioned, that is not included in this cost estimate, nor are the boardwalks or the trails on the west side in that uh, natural area. It would just include the measures that would make it um, uh, uh, suitable for mitigation of stormwater, um, but it would be it would include the native plantings and all of that kind of stuff, and some bank restoration as well. So that's what's included and what's not. Uh, if desired, uh, city <coughs> staff could present a menu uh, for additional park items at a future city council meeting. We do need to have some direction on. Um, which items you're going to want to go forward with. Tonight, we are only asking uh, for direction so that we can move forward with design, and we're looking at the, at, you know, the uh, 11 or the 12.5 uh, figure. With that, we wanted to pause, and uh, there is a couple more slides, but we wanted to give you a, a little bit of time uh, to give us any input that you'd have at this time. Yes. Thank you, Alder. Yeah, Chuck, I have a question. Can you just talk high level and maybe bring up Steve? Just talk about the trade offs between the 7.6 and the 9.5. And so, what would we be getting or not getting if we went to one or the other? I mean, it seems like you have the center infrastructure for viewing and access, but then from programming in terms of trade offs and capacity, mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of maybe explore the, you know, the key structural issues on those options and how how the advisory committee thought about it or the staff you could just talk about that a little bit yeah i think the key thing to to realize when we started the process the the thing that we wanted to drive that was pro looking at our programming current programming potential programming that's why we hired johnson so that was a key factor so we went they they did repair they prepared a uh, market analysis but it was a lot more than that it it actually had a lot of good information on how we could utilize these fields so there's more to do in that but one of the biggest thing things driving uh, the decision toward 9.5 is the the ability to use what we have need for in the community there what it did reveal that we needed additional space so that that's a key factor uh, difference that I think uh, really drove a lot of it um, secondary was if you go with the 7.6 uh, Steve talked about this but I'll rephrase it as everything is a little bit tight so all of those boundary lines everything is compressed you're not going to going to get the flexibility or be able to address or meet the needs of all the many programs out there. Our focus is, is first and foremost, it, it, it's our residents and our programming with REC, but also those other groups that I mentioned, these, uh, the, like LF, uh, the, the soccer and the, um, all of the different groups that will utilize this. So those were a couple of the big ones. He mentioned some of the Additional benefits with the path that ties into that. I think those are really important as well. But the main thing I think is the layout, the improved uh, flexibility, but also the expanded fields that are different fields that we can offer. 
Yeah, just to follow up on that. I mean, were there safety issues? I mean, I, I if if you look at the two slides of the 7.6 and the configuration options across sports, it seemed like there's a lot going on. I mean, and there's could be lacrosse balls flying around, and you know, so was that considered in terms of what's appropriate buffering mm -hmm. in the yeah. playing areas for safety issues for the spectators and the players? I just yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, obviously there are some things that you can't do together. Baseball is going, you know, it, it, fortunately, our consultants looked at this on a season by season. They laid it out over the months to look in detail at how all of this would function. Um, and there was a concern, and, and Steve alluded to that a little bit with those buffer areas that do, it's not only an inconvenience, it, it can be a safety factor as well. So certainly was part of the conversation with everything being tight, there is concern that um, there could be injuries, there could be issues with putting it in that tight. It doesn't eliminate it, but it certainly takes us in the right direction. Uh, anything okay. to add to that? I don't, I, I don't know if there was anything else on the more so specific. Other can you, observations? Oh, sure. Can you pull that slide up again that showed the configurations of the fields in the 9.5 acre? Yep. This, uh, so, the 9.5? Yeah. Yeah. So technically, you could have baseball on the left hand side and then lacrosse on the right. I mean, you could mix and match. You could. We based are. On the needs. I mean, how often do you have to paint the field? Doesn't that. We haven't made any determination play. on what permanent lines we would have on this. Mm. We're, we don't <clears throat> currently desire to have a hodgepodge of markings that will be very confusing. We want to keep that simple. Um, I will say that with baseball, we're looking at the possibility of temporary home run fences. Obviously, we couldn't do permanent ones, but we would have temporary ones out there. Uh, so, yeah, the, the fields we do have more flexibility. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but it did that mm -hmm. cover it. Okay. Yes. Alderman, Alderman. Morris. Um, so the school system will be able to use this for recess and after school programming, I presume. Uh, that is, uh, something that we have talked about. We do have one member, uh, from the school on our advisory group, and they are certainly interested in that, and it is something that um, we would work with them, and that's why we continue to work with the school as well. They, they have great interest in it. It would be a benefit of, to them as well. I assume we could ask them for a financial contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you might be going there as the, the finance chair, but yeah, I think uh, that, that would probably okay. follow. And, and I'm happy to jump in on that just to note that um, while we would expect <clears throat> the school to have the ability to utilize it during the school day for recess and other, uh, you know, outdoor related activities after school programming would be a little more complicated if it's in conflict with uh, parks and recreation programming or some of the private athletic leagues that are renting the fields uh, for for a you know a prescribed uh, rental fee or rate as it pertains to cost considerations and cost sharing considerations you know we have a unique situation where we own the property uh, even though they are obviously a beneficiary of any improvements that are made there in our conversations with the schools and again the intent is not to get deep into this tonight but specific to the traffic and parking considerations it has been communicated that while we're looking at some preliminary design work to consider improvements that are really of greater benefit to the school in terms of addressing some of the stacking and congestion issues that they uh, you know encounter during school pickup hours it has been conveyed that it's otherwise given the price tag we're looking at here not likely to be a high priority for the city to fund so if they are interested in having the city further pursue some of those traffic improvement um, uh, initiatives, it would likely need to come in, in the form of, of direct funding from the schools to do that. So we've had that conversation. We've not yet received feedback from uh, District 67 on um, their uh, appetite for that, but certainly we're having those conversations. Okay. Then um, one other question. So I, I, you've given it a lot of thought to water flow from east to west. 
But that's private property on the south. So have you talked to them about the impact on their property from this change? Uh, we have not talked to Wincy about it. Um, I don't know that there's any impact. I, I hate to put Dave on. I, he's shaking his head no. <laughs> you, you probably well, come. please step yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Speak into the microphone so you can be heard on sure. out in uh, TV land. Sure, yeah. Um, so when we look at the stormwater and the drainage, the floodplain, all of those issues as it relates to water on the site, the ordinances require that we aren't causing any impacts off site. So as part of the preliminary design, we've worked through all that. So no expectation of any off site issues for anyone really in particular to the south. Okay, thanks. I, I did have one other question. Does this include taking out the tennis courts? This would not. Uh, the current what you're looking at tonight does not include okay. the tennis courts. We would only if you get into that whole parking thing. Correct. And that is a whole separate. It is. Okay. Thank you. But the condition of those tennis courts is pretty poor, from it what is. I understand. So they're due for replacement. Yes, we would have to look at the next steps. We have, you know, obviously we knew about this project for a while, so we did hold <laughs> off, not knowing if we were going to move them right away, um, but as it looks like we won't, we would have to take some kind of uh, corrective action. Mayor, to that point, uh, sadly, um, <clears throat> those tennis courts we have over Deer Path are probably the best playing ones in our park system. And that's coming from my daughters that are two collegiate tennis players. So just interesting kind of because we have things in two, perspective. two parks with with the quality of the court, though, is effectively what it comes down to. We just did, we did yeah, that's South my Park. park. So, and and Waveland within right. the last five and years. And I can tell you the South Park courts are great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. great. Well, and I don't want to digress from the yeah. conversation. Yeah, let's not, let's, this is, but it's not a subject for tonight. Alderman <laughs> Notes. Chuck, I was curious, from a programming standpoint, would you be contemplating putting fields that are a mix of the turf and a baseball's dirt infield? Uh, because we, that... Yeah. You're talking about a natural type infield, infield. Right. Is that not what's contemplated, or uh, it is not? And the main re I mean, we did look at that, and as we did a number of site visits, we looked at different options, uh, and we did observe that a lot of fields nowadays are becoming artificial turf. Um, we, because of the multi, the the I should say the flexibility that this offers, we can't have the natural infield okay so that was the main reason why we didn't um some people do that a lot of them we're finding do not and people are getting used to playing on it so uh, the soccer field would be a consistent service within the bounds of those yep and the colors are here don't really mean anything we could choose to make them uh just a little bit different color for the infield so none of that's been determined Great. yet thank you alderman rummel can you go back to where you're showing the floodplain and the river and the improvements? So am I correct in understanding that our improvements would end at that yellow line? On this side? On um, the west side, yeah. On the west side. Yeah, well, with one exception, we would be doing some work along the edge of the Skokie just to pull back the... Um, there's a pretty eroded edge to that, the river. That would be pulled back, meaning they would do some excavation there. Uh, Dave can speak more detail if you'd like, but we, we need to do that um, because it will provide additional um, detention for stormwater. So with that, if just along the bank, that work would be included in the cost that we mentioned mm -hmm. before. Well, what ha what's going on in that other gray area then? Is that just in, in here? You're just going to leave that? No, no it would be. It, it, it would be. <clears throat> there would be grading, uh, and again, I'll let Dave uh, speak if if I don't cover it. But there would be grading and native plantings in that area. So it's it's all all of this would be part of the detention system for stormwater. So native plantings, this would, no, this would not be playable turf or anything like that. It's meant to be a native area. So then really, but so is the area that's to the 
east of the yellow line, right? So why isn't the yellow line all the way to yeah. the Skokie River is, I guess, my question. You're, you're going to be, you're just telling me you're yeah. going to be doing uh, improvements yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna all, yeah. all the way to I'll the Skokie River. I'll let Dave go River. through with more detail, but um, my understanding is it's mainly along the Skokie, but let's let the expert say it better. Sure. So, so you, as we evaluated the bigger picture with the advisory committee, um, you know, part of where the line breaks down is a little bit um, based upon that. So where the yellow line kind of runs northwest to southeast now, that's the flood way. So everything west of there, what that means is basically we can't do anything in there. Um, but we can do things like excavate for restoration, simple trail, things like that. So when we look at why the yellow line is where it's at there is because that's our base project area that's going to be part of it. So when you look at the little triangle to the east of the line or to the right of the line, that's our detention basin. And that's going to be a nice naturalized area. The way that we kind of you know sold it or suggested it to the advisory committee when we were sitting in the municipal complex is your nice native wetlands at the at the new municipal complex over by Middle Fork there. That's what we're shooting for there, something you know akin to that. West of there, what we need to do in there is really going to be a little bit dependent upon what size field you choose and you know, ultimately where we head with some of the other amenities in the future. Right now in this base condition, all we would really need to do there is pull that bank back at a nice shallow slope, put some native vegetation on it, clean it up. That's going to prevent a lot of you know, soil material from getting into the river and you know, causing water quality issues. It's going to keep that bank more stable. It's going to add some habitat there. Everything else that could happen in there would only really fundamentally be required if the project were to expand. Does that kind of answer the question? So are you planting trees in that area? Uh, last time we spoke, Chuck, I asked you about trees. And you said we're not planting trees, we're going to be planting shrubs, but it looks to me like there are some trees in that area. Those yes, may no? be a few shrubs in there. It'd all be native. Everything in that basin would be kind of looking at developing a native planting plan that's, you know, consistent with what our final design is for that, what our water levels are, how that's going to function so we've got the right plants in there. So that's a little bit to be determined, but native plants that are appropriate for those communities is what that would end up looking and like. And so how many acres is all of that if we go all the way to the Skokie River, for example? I think the, you know, the, the you know, sort of the trapezoidal block of it is, I think, about four acres, if I'm recalling. Yeah. And is the thought that that area would be sufficient to filter pollutants out of any runoff from these fields? Oh, and then some, yeah. And I mean, you know, quite honestly, you know, we look at it holistically. This isn't about just shoehorning in, you know, a little rain garden here or there. It's how we can take what, what you know, what the site's doing and make sure not only are we meeting the ordinance requirements, but I think Chuck's gonna get into the selection of some of the materials. This whole field is is pervious. I mean, it's going to end up being able to filter through it, and then we've got that granular layer, you know, the, of gravel underneath there. Then that's going into the soils underneath there, and our drainage system is going to collect it and manage manage it from there. And then it's going to work its way west to the river. So, quite honestly, between what you're having to put into managing turf there and what other whatever soil can come off of there. This is going to be as good or better from the perspective of filtering that runoff as it comes over, and that's by design, but also you know by goal of the project. And can I ask you one other question? So, if we cut this back to 7.6 acres, do we gain any of that uh, eastern edge of facilities that you cut out in the 10 point? or 9.5 acre yeah. thing. So would would we be able to regain some of those amenities like the playground and other things that, I mean, would that be something we should be considering when we're deciding which of these plans to go with? Would we be gaining some more amenities on the eastern side of this if we went with smaller fields yeah i think I'd, i'll defer to steve and chuck a little bit on that as far as programmatically but as it relates to the stormwater, it's not a it's not an apples to apples comparison necessarily um 
you know, that's based on total disturbance. And so we really aren't gaining open space necessarily. It's just what you're going to, you know, what you're going to make it. And, and I think just before, you know, they kind of opine a little bit on what may or may not be lost on that. To Chuck's point previously, it's not as simple as just flipping all that stuff from the east to the west if you wanted to do it in the, f in the future. We had an actual 100-year storm during the design, you know, up to this point of this project. I think everyone remembers that in July. And that was, uh, you know, I think a good moment for us to step back and kind of just show everybody, like, there are things that could be underwater if we wanted them to. But is that what we want to do in, in this investment is, is have a playground that, you know, for 10 days a year is underwater. The general direction from the advisory committee and staff was, no, we don't. So that's kind of what's lent the western area to being, the you know, the natural open space. So. Steve is going to further address that. So if you did down, if you chose the 7.6 acres versus 9.5 acres, you could keep that field footprint a little further west to maintain the space for those some of those play components that was represented, but by not but even under that that smaller field footprint by not shifting that east, that could still have some implications to the stormwater challenges because then what we're adding to the project is the stormwater needs of developing those other amenities on the east side. So in other words, now once you add those other components you're adding other disturbance and hardscape and impervious surfaces that would need to be taken into account for. So you, you kind of work, you kind of like one step forward, two steps back sort of a thing. So you could make the space, but it could have other, other stormwater detention implications that we would have to work through to verify what that would mean from a cost standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think you did lose a lot of amenities when you cut all, all of that out for a community park. So, you know, I don't know, maybe we should look at what exactly that would involve and how many of those amenities we could get back. Can you mitigate the storm runoff? I don't know the answer to that. Just, right. just some thoughts. I thought those were nice amenities on the east side. Although they're in the, you know, future, future vision plan yeah. as opposed to but they're the never the never plan the right. way this well, is. Well, there may right. be other, right. I, presumably there may be other locations that they could be put. Uh, Mr. Mayor, go ahead. So Chuck, can you just reiterate the recommendations that the advisory committee has made? And because it sounds like you want us to decide on seven, um, six or nine, five, and then a shift east. But I, I kind of want to understand what the recommendation is and what they thought. Because I don't know, we really talked about a community park versus an athletic con. Uh, complex and the trade-offs because we have a lot of community parks but we don't have an athletic complex so I'm kind of just curious what the recommendation was from the group if you could just yeah reiterate that yeah we're gonna go back to that at the end but the main recommendation was that uh, the city their recommendation was that the city go forward with the 9.5 acres uh, configuration that's all and that's based on uh, and in agreement with Johnson Consulting, uh, city staff as well. That is our recommendation. And how does that, 5. if I could interrupt, how does that relate to the original priorities that were established in the community survey? Uh, back when uh, the previous uh, preliminary design work was going on, um, I believe that it was comparable. The I, I think the 10 acres we ca we called it generally 10 acres. Um, that was what was shown, um, and it was through city council requesting that we look at a smaller option. Uh, so the 7.6 that eventually came out of this, I don't know if that relates specifically to the original direction, um, but we certainly talked about a larger size field, the 10. Acre. And, and I can jump in. I think uh, if I understand the question, when we had asked the community for feedback on criteria that the city should be considering when evaluating options for the park, maximizing playability did score at the top consistently. Um, and so certainly the, the more fields that are available for use at Deer Path, the more we're furthering or accomplishing that goal. The one thing I will note is that through the 
uh, analysis by Johnson Consulting, even with our efforts to consolidate athletic activity uh, at Deer Path Park, this park alone, even at nine and a half acres, is not sufficient in size to meet all of the programming needs of the community, which is okay and a good thing that we will still be utilizing other parks in our Parks and Rec portfolio for athletic activity. And I think a benefit from a, certainly from a maintenance perspective, but also from a quality of a playing condition perspective is that the more we can uh, spread out, if you will, uh, athletic activity on our natural grass fields, the more time those fields have to rest and recover, the better condition we can keep them in. If the council, I'm going back six to eight months now, but if you recall the conversations we were having, the biggest challenge in adequately maintaining grass fields was just the high volume and intensity of usage and the inability of those fields to recover uh, after they were torn up. And so I think in, uh, you know, a secondary benefit to looking at having the ability to consolidate uh, a lot of ath athletic activity here is that all of the remaining community parks that will still be hosting athletic events uh, or other sporting events will naturally just be in better condition uh, for the community and for the users who are playing on them. I just want to, because it goes to Alderman Preschleck's point. I'm sorry, Alderman Weber, you've had your okay, hand I'm up for a while. Okay, I'm done at the end of the line. Someday um, it'll get my turn. But, but I just, um, you're, ne you're next. I, I just want to clarify what Alderman Preschleck was saying. I thought that that you said that the advisory group has not seen this plan with the Eastern stuff cut out because it was after the fact that you discovered that you needed to shift this whole thing further east to get out of the floodplain. Is that accurate? Uh, no, not exactly. The, I was talking about the conceptual vision plan. We haven't revised that to show it to the, going to the east. However, the diagrams that you've seen, uh, well, like this one, that's what we use to talk about. So we talk specifically about this core area with them. So they did see the options, whereas they would uh, desire, I'm sure, to have some of those play features. Um, it was expressed during our meetings that we didn't know if that was going to happen or not. They were kind of outside of the core area. Uh, and it is still possible, as the mayor mentioned, as the mayor mentioned, um, that if it is the desire to have those kind of structures, we could look at and ask the design team to explore other areas. Those would be an additional cost in the end, but we've, looked, we've talked about fitness areas being spread out on the trail possibly, um, things like that. Um, the shelter, we don't have to have a shelter over there. A play structure, we'd all like to have a feature like that when older brothers and sisters are playing, the younger kids can go to the playground. There is a playground across in the, in the school. Um, however, it is a desire, certainly, not a requirement though. Uh, we, we, we did talk about this, um, and I think uh, the advisory group, it was clear that um, there were two different things going on. The bigger picture, the um, dream big, and then the reality of we need to make a decision on 7.6 or 9.5. Very clear distinction that those were different things. We weren't making decisions about parking or traffic or anything like that. Alderman Weber. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, I want to say just a huge thanks to um, Chair Beidler and the whole, all the city staff and members of the advisory committee. This is a really fabulous presentation. I mean, it, it brings it to light um, as a parent having a child that started flag football tonight. I was hoping we could just circle back to those diagrams again of the 9.5 acre configurations of the, and since that's the only real experience I have out on these fields, would we be looking at this bottom left where it's like the soccer, is that similar to how many fields or appropriate size fields would be like a flag football? Yeah, okay. Yep, I'm getting the thumbs up so from Anthony. with that, <laughs> I know that this year alone they had over 100 children uh, playing flag football. So there's like 12 teams. So I'm looking at this saying, what an incredible opportunity to have all of those teams out there playing at one time instead of spreading out your Saturday between 9 and 1. Mm -hmm. 
um, for an hour so or half hour, whatever, how long the games are. So I think, it, in my opinion, the usability and the flexibility of the 9.5 acre field is a great way to go. Um, a couple additional comments. Um, I think the bathroom facilities, if you're going to go ahead and invest this kind of money into playing fields, you need bathrooms to support the people, the athletes, and their families and those viewers who are there. So I think that's a very high priority, in my opinion, as someone who's out there. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, I love the conceptual visions of the advisory group and saying, gosh, if we had, you know, we could just wave our wand and what could we do? I think all of that is fabulous, but I think that the the key is our missing piece in our por portfolio, as you call it, is this type of field and viewing area. We have other parks for little kids. I'm not sure if I'm over on the way far west side. I want my four-year-old going all the way to the east side where the parking lot is, and I, it's a long way to see what he's doing over there. Um, so I don't. it almost might become an attractive nuisance to have a playground way over there just from a you know a mother with small children mm -hmm. but um, I think anything we can do later maybe there's private funding opportunities uh, for some of these other improvements but this has been really great and thank you for showing it to us all right thank you for your input I do want to publicly thank our uh, our advisory group as well under the leadership of Peru uh, they really were a pleasure to work with we had some really good uh, discussions uh, during this and they did challenge us and we we had a really um, uh, productive time with them we're not done by the way we may bring them back together one more time uh, later in the process <laughs> First of all, on behalf of the advisory group, um, I appreciate the opportunity that the city manager and this incredible team, um, some of the staff I knew from previous work from when I was an alderman, but there's wonderful people who are still here, a new team, our consultants, it's just been great. We knew right from the start what our mandate was, um, but there's something that you all have to worry about that we didn't, and that's the money. We were told right from the start, think about what should be there, think about the need, but the money will be dealt with by city council. So it was a kind, there was a kind of a luxury to that. So um, the reason I wasn't planning to come up, but the reason I'm coming up was that question that Alderman Rummel asked about, did we know about the Eastern? We hadn't actually, we had talked about it, we learned a lot in the course of the probably, I figure, you know, it was about, meetings were officially two hours, they usually went to two and a half, and then sometimes some of us stayed afterwards and talked with, with staff and consultants and so on. Um, so we had a lot of time together, and I, I, I didn't know about mitigation as much before. Some of you are, are quite aware of all of that, but that having open spaces where there would be places underneath that you could, that you could have water going, we certainly know that water was driving what we were doing. We know that, we know about the, the, the flooding situation and so on. So, but the tonight was the first time I saw numbers and we didn't hear a $2 million number that would, was what it was gonna cost if we wanted to do this stuff on the east side and, and have, uh, and, and uh, with, with the layout that had that space there. We didn't have to talk about that, but if we had, I feel, and I know there's some other, you know, somebody can jump up and say, that's not right. That would have been a huge factor to us. But we were told that we needed to be thinking that that was going to be your purview. We needed to be thinking specifically about how is this the best project we can make it, given that it's the first time we've done this, um, we've done the, we've done the synthetic turf in the community. And even though the people in the, in the t group, the, the, the volunteer team came from a lot of different backgrounds, we always knew, we've always had our eye on that prize, make this the best project we can. There's no question that we, I think, I mean, I think we talked about this hypothetically, we just didn't have that $2 million price tag attached, but we would have said, look, what we need is the space to play. This is what's the shortage in town. We also have been absolutely loyal to doing everything we can by the Skokie. We, 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 uh, th there's been real effort to ca call it the Skokie River. Most of us who've lived here a while call it the Skokie Ditch, and we walked it. A number of us went out and, and, and walked it, and it does need 
it does need some remediation, and it doesn't. The, the picture where you see the yellow line, Alderman Rommel, we will definitely make sure, however we have to figure it out, whether it's private or whatever, we're going to get that cleaned up a little bit along the river so it will be usable and enjoyable. But, but again, thank you for the opportunity to do this. It was a great team, and um, uh, $2 million is a lot of money. We, could, we, could, we, we need to you know, keep that kind of thing in mind, and, and it was lucky that we didn't have to before. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments before we turn it back to Chuck to wrap up? Okay. All right, just a couple slides left. We did want to talk a, a little bit about the evaluation uh, criteria. Uh, so this is related to another one of the recommendations by the advisory group. Uh, so staff has, um, since the start, we have met with a number of different turf vendors a lot there's a lot of product uh, that we needed to learn about uh, we have done a lot of site visits in uh, northern illinois and wisconsin we have visited lots of sites looking at different products and looking at um, different layouts all of that kind of stuff we're not done uh, we're continuing to look at the products um, but we were very impressed by what we were seeing out there. Um, there are, our, our lens, again, was that environmental sensitivity, but also player safety, all of the things that I'm going to talk about with the criteria. Um, we knew that we were hearing that they would come at a cost, but we heard that they were very important to the community. So that's what we developed were we looked at products that in some cases we knew were the best technology for player safety on the market. Other products that we knew would deal with heat. Thing, and we, we, right from the beginning, we said no crumb rubber. We were starting with that. And we began to look at different products out there that would deal with heat, recyclability, things like that. So we're pretty excited. I, I would say our staff team is pretty excited about what we found out there. But again, we're not here to make that decision uh, tonight. We also found that um, there were, we heard the concerns about plastics going into the system. Um, there aren't any products out there that we found that aren't going to have plastics. So we decided to look at products that would prevent things from going into the river. So we, we believe that we found some great products that are somewhat new. Um, there is a huge movement in the industry to kind of clean up this, uh, some of the things that have been talked about over the years. So um, they hear it loud and clear. They know that they need to address the recyclability, the, um, the ability for the turf to stay in place, to not migrate, all of those things, heat, all of those are being addressed by the industry. And that's what we tapped into to find that out. So we, talk, we did talk to the, the advisory group about some of the products, but our main uh, ask that last night was just to uh, support uh, the idea of criteria. And that's what we're asking of you as well. We want to make sure we're on the, the same page and we're moving forward with the same criteria. So it is the player safety, it's playability, it's maintenance, durability, and environmental sensitivity. All of those things are the, the, the lens that we're looking at this project through to make sure we're addressing uh, these issues. So with that, um, the, the final selection of materials has not been made, obviously. We have some that we like a lot um, that we will be excited to bring to you at one point. Um, but that's, that's what we asked the advisory group to help us with. Um, the final slide um, is, again, recapping what we've been talking about, the three asks. And as um, City Manager Wisha mentioned, the top one is the clearly the, the, the main reason we're here tonight. Um, but the advisory group, the direction that we're um, requesting is support for the advisory group's recommendation to do a 9.5 acre synthetic turf configuration, and then to direct staff to select uh, turf field 
material options based on that evaluation criteria that I just mentioned. Um, player safety, playability, maintenance, demand, and durability and environmental sensitivity. Um, and then finally, to continue to develop the conceptual vision plan. Um, and that would provide a framework uh, for future council decisions. So it's not an approval of the plan or anything. It's just we, we needed to check in with you, make sure we're going down this in the right direction, particularly on the second two. The first one, it's, in, it's very important that we know that tonight. Um, our design team going forward, um, as we start getting into final design, it's crucial if we're gonna stay on track uh, for approval later this year, potentially, to be able to keep going. It's a tight schedule and we need to move forward with one field size. With that, uh, if there's any questions or further comment. Before we do that, um, I think what, what, I, what I think feels right is to take some public comment and then bring it back to the council for sort of a uh, uh, you know, review of where everybody uh, is coming out. So um, I do have a written slip from Paul Heyman. So uh, Paul, if you'd like to come up and. I'm Paul Hammond, lifetime resident of Lake Forest. I read the 34 page research report on turf prepared by a Big Ten University, they had four main points. One, risk, increased number of heat strokes. Two, turf temperature is 55 degrees hotter than natural grass. Three, Penn State measured a surface temperature at a local field at more than 174 degrees Fahrenheit. You can fry an egg if the surface temperature is more than 158 degrees Fahrenheit. So the surface temperature of the turf is hot enough to fry bacon and eggs. The Consumer Product Safety Commission recommends that water heaters have a maximum temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent burns. The plumbing codes limit Hot water temperature available to residents at shower heads shall not exceed 110 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent burns. The guidelines are not to use plastic fields when the surface temperature are above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Since every Deer Path Intermediate student in the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades will be exposed to the turf field in gym classes, you better have every parent sign a waiver indicating an increased risk of heat stroke and that the temperature of the plastic field has been measured by research scientists at over 174 degrees Fahrenheit. For safety reasons, the professionals have cooling fans on both sides of the turf field because of the excessive heat. They have oxygen tanks on both sides of the turf field because of the excessive heat. They have licensed medical doctors on both sides of the field because of the excessive heat, ice, and drinks available for all the players. Any city council member who votes yes for the expenditure for turf fields better make sure that the city liability insurance covers you for the next 10 years or the life of the turf, whichever is longer, because when the first heart stroke case occurs, I'm sure the parents are gonna indicate that they never knew of the excessive heat risk or that plastic fields generate that much heat or that the field temperature may exceed 174 degrees Fahrenheit. Since this is now on video, when you're subpoenaed, you will not be able to deny knowing the facts. You will be deliberately subjecting young children to temperatures measured by a respected Big Ten Research University at more than 174 degrees Fahrenheit. So for the turf fields, any team playing on it will not only have to hire a referee, but you will be required to have a licensed doctor for safety reasons because of the excessive heat and obtain oxygen tanks and cooling fans for each game like the professionals. Finally, all this excessive heat from the turf fields add to global warming and climate change. Chicago Cubs play on natural grass. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Any other member of the public who would like to speak about this issue and inform the city council? Rick? Good evening, Rick Amos. I had the pleasure of serving on the advisory board uh, and I thought I would just uh, raise a couple points to Alderman Preslack and Alderman uh, Rummel's questions. Um, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that the advisory group challenged city staff and the consultants as to which size should the athletic fields be, meaning seven, six, nine, five, or somewhere in between. And it was through that process that we learned and came back to Johnson Consulting of saying that nine size was the optimal size for the reasons you raised, which is in soccer and various sports, as you go from U6 to U8 to U12 to U16, field size changes. And so as, as your players get older and you need to increase field size, you need the space obviously to do that if you want to still have eight fields or six fields or things of that nature. So when we looked at optimization of the, the, the student athletes and of the athletes that are used the field, it was quickly determined we needed more space uh, to be able to accommodate all those field size as the athletes get older uh, and use the field over the next 10 years. The second point I would raise was that I think Alderman Preshak brought it up. The 7.6 design is, is very tight. So baseball fields uh, are shorter in the left field and the right field foul lines. Um, your ability to have balls flying into other courts, athletes running onto other fields or running into each other is certainly going to increase because you don't have the buffer zone uh, inside, inside those fields. So through that process, it was quickly determined that 9-5 was really the way to go without creating potential un, un, unintended consequences, if you will, of hazards of, of compacting that many athletes into in that small of a space. In terms of uh, Alderman Rummel's comments around, you know, is this, an, is this a community park or is this going to become a sports complex? And again, as, as Prue pointed out, we didn't have the benefit of budget and worrying about the budget and doing this. The thought was maintaining community park and by doing that, adding other amenities for other family members and other non-athletes, if you will, in the community to enjoy would improve the likelihood of more people attending that facility and using that facility. So, you know, certainly the east side amenities, if you will, made it feel more like uh, a community park, if you will. But obviously, as Prue pointed out, we didn't have to worry about paying for all this, right? Um, and so certainly the thought was is having the, all the above, if you will, would, would certainly make this a, a grand facility that all of us would be proud of. But, you know, at some point it has to be paid for. So thank you. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Any other members of the public that would like to speak to the council? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'm going to turn it around and just kind of bring it back to the council for comments. And I think I'd like to start with uh, Alderman Weber this time since she oh. Thank you, <laughs> usually Mary. has to go last. Uh, <laughs> just basically to reiterate my uh, comment earlier, I think the 9-5 is uh, the best fit for the usage by our community. And I do um, agree directing staff to, in terms of the select field type material, um, I know that they have only the best for our residents in mind. And um, continue the planning. Thank you. Alderman Bushman. Thank you. Uh, I recognize that the council at the prior meeting uh, decided we we're just gonna look at turf fields and uh, in that context, uh, trying to decide uh, the size. Um, I am uh, quite pleased and comforted by the work that uh, Johnson Consultants have done to look at the programs, the needs of the community, and to look at it, to me very importantly, as a community park. And uh, to the extent we've done that uh, and identified the need, uh, it'd be great that we can support our community with a, with a beautiful park. Two caveats, so with that, uh, I always come up with my caveats. Uh, one is the environmental concerns, and you talk about environmental sustainability, I'll use a different term, environmental impact, and obviously that we have the unknown of the type of material and what it is and what it may do to the environment. 
And uh, we really do need to, need to be very cognizant of that and to understand what impact uh, it may have. You know, you read articles regularly about PFAS and other issues out there about toxic chemicals and how it can get into the environment. And I know it earlier was expressed how important it is to our community to be responsive and to be a responsible citizen to our environment. And the other caveat is cost. Uh, you know, it, it's nice to look at it with the vacuum and, and crew. I understand, you know, it is a nice way to do it, but eventually we got to ask the question, who's going to pay for it? And not just pay for it, but what impact it will have on other priorities we have. Uh, we struggle regularly in deciding among priority one projects, you know, what we're going to spend the money on, what impact it's going to go have on our, our credit rating and our borrowing power. Uh, I recognize it's not for us now, but I think that can well impact how we go from here. So are you generally supportive of them continuing on the path that's on the board, on the board here? Uh, the, the concern I always had is whether we're going to be overbuilding, but I take comfort with cons Johnson Consulting, with the things that were said, and the desirability of having this buffer space between the fields, whether it be for safety, convenience, flexibility. Uh, so. I think you know we can go forward. It makes more sense to do nine five and seven six unless we end up saying there's environmental problems here. We really have to cut back so we don't have the impact. Of course, the money's not there. Right, understood. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, I, I do want to thank you, Chuck, and the entire team. And I know there have been a lot of you working on this, spending countless hours, and deeply appreciative of you bringing us a very thorough presentation. Um, secondly, I do want to thank former Alderman Beidler for her work and working as a cohesive unit uh, with the advisory group under uh, the watchful eye of uh, City Manager Wisha. So thank you very much. You've done a great service to us all. Um, quick and to the point, I'm strongly in favor of the 9.5 acres. I think the Johnson Group, uh, which I'm assuming dealt with the programming component of it, uh, that's a dictating factor for me because when we look at our original metrics in terms of playability, you know, programming, fan experience, environment, I think that's that is the the key metric for us here. Um, I know Alderman Bushman did bring up several other key items, which I don't think are up for discussion tonight. Um, you know, as a looking forward, I would strongly agree with Alderman Weber about some of those ancillary needs that we, we should have there. Uh, but I think it's important for us all to realize, and I think uh, City Manager Wisha said, when we do design this, we want it to be the best possible facility there is on the North Shore. And I think taking into account all of those things, product, uh, stormwater management, uh, everything that uh, really makes us stand head and shoulders above the rest. Uh, and Ray, I am sensitive to your, your concerns about costs, and that's a discussion for another night, but I think when you consider costs, you have to talk about cost and take things into perspective. Uh, this is, by dollar amount, the biggest project we've looked at to date, but if you're gonna use real dollars, and I always go back to the beach project, you know, back in 1985, that was $8.5 million, and if we were to move that dollar value up to 22, uh, 2022, the equivalent there would be about $24 million. When we borrowed that money in 1985, I think the bond rates were north of 10%. And I just looked it up here and it was up towards 11%. We're in an incredibly favorable environment right now to borrow money. And I think talking about cost is a little it can be uh, always a metric we should be aware of, but it might be short-sighted. Um, so I, I'd love for my colleagues to take that into consideration and look at historical precedent that we do in Lake Forest and wanting to have the best product available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to start with thanking Prue Beidler. Um, didn't do that earlier. I was just kind of asking questions. Um, you know, Pruitt, you've done a lot of for the community, so thanks. Um, you know, with Market Square and uh, Forest Park, I was on the HBC when, when you were involved in that. Uh, obviously, the Deer Path Golf Course and um, 
you know, a lot of other things. And so thanks for answering the call. And, um, you know, I guess this town is special because of volunteerism and people just doing things just to make it a better community. And so, so thank you. And to everybody that was involved in it, so thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think 9-5 is the best option for all the reasons enumerated. Uh, I think on the second point, I, uh, I do want to add costs in there because these are all trade-offs that we want to just be transparent about and have conversations about. So I think if we think about turf field material and options, I, I certainly agree with the list. Uh, I do think um, it's just natural to understand well how much different configurations would cost, and so I, I'd add that, you know, to the criteria. And then in terms of the conceptual plan, uh, as a base scenario, I'm really comfortable w w as so with the nine five, and then shifted east to avoid you know the what'd you say two million dollar stormwater management um, to have the accoutrements on the on the east because I, I do think. I'd probably be preferring um, us taking a look in the conceptual vision plan or the master plan to see where we could feather those in to different areas and maybe it's not as concentrated or as Ald Alderman Luby Weber said, you know, so we don't have this right now. Uh, there's maybe other alternatives uh, in our city around a community park, but I, I do get that it would add to the draw so, but let's think creatively about where we can feather them around and maybe it's not so concentrated and, and utilitarian in one place and, you know, I think we can do that well. So that's my feedback and thank you very much again for all your work. Thank you. Alderman Rummel. Uh, thank you and, uh, uh, you know, Prue, you and I go back a ways and thank you for this project as well. So, and your committee, uh, you had a super committee. Um, yeah, I was just trying to uh, ferret out uh, what the actual differences are between the, uh, the smaller and the larger and what we're giving up from the smaller plan when we go with the larger plan. And to me, it was those amenities to the east, and I think that they're significant. Um, I do think that not only can they be be uh, feathered in, as Alderman Preschlack said, into this plan, but that whole um, campus of the recreation center perhaps could lend itself to, um, you know, some of these things like a bigger playground or, or those types of amenities. So, uh, and I think you do get, uh, I think you're, you're putting too large a development into too small a, a pouch when you go with the smaller configuration and the playability and the number of fields that you're trying to get out of it. So I would also go with a nine and a half um, acre uh, configuration. And I do agree with the criteria that are on the board and continuing to pay attention to those. Um, but I wanted uh, just, um, go back, it's my understanding that we are not putting any irrigation uh, to water these fields to cool them down. Is that accurate, anybody? I mean, isn't that an option to cool down the heat that these? Yeah, and I'll, I'll let Steve correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we did have an option to put in, it wasn't like an irrigation system that's going to sprinkle, but more of a um, quick connect um, for maintenance and things like that. It wasn't our intent to have a feature that would cool them. And again, not to <laughs> steal from a future discussion, but we think that the products we choose can reduce that heat. So more to come on that, but um, that's where we're at right now. No irrigation system, but certainly quick connects, which means you can plug a hose in for maintenance at any time. Yeah, but not along for, the outside. Not for cool. I mean, some not for cooling. Some of these facilities specifically put in sprinkler systems Correct. to right. deal with the. I mean, the heat's not insignificant that come off of these fields. Uh, you know, if there's some other product out there. Terrific, let's look at that. Um, but, uh, you know, we do need to pay attention to that in the design. Um, 
you know, I've also heard that some of these uh, synthetic grasses are made with lead in the paint product that they use. So, um, and even small amounts of that are not safe for children to inhale. So I'm assuming the industry has moved beyond that and that we will certainly not be going with anything like the crumb rubber is out and I assume that you'll be sure that anything with lead in it is also not included in this. Yeah, we are aware. I'm of sure of that. Yeah. that's legal anymore. Yeah. No asbestos either. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Steve's gonna add to your, he'll add to your question on irrigation. Hopefully I didn't speak. Well, just, just one clarification on that. I mean, Chuck is correct the fact that there's not an, uh, not an irrigation system that's being designed to, uh, that'd be automated. That could, but the, the irrigation system that is going to be part of the project, as Chuck mentioned, is a quick coupler system. So it does it, it allows for not just hooking up um, facilities for maintenance, but also for cooling. It's just not an automated system. Oh, okay. But it will provide you areas of access where you could set that up on a temporary and a portable basis. So if you go out there before a game and you find that the, the field temperature is 120 degrees, you can go out there and sprinkle the field and lower the temperature. It, well, there's, it's, it's, a little more complicated than that, but it's it, uh, the water is one component of the possibility of, of cooling the fields. But there, there's a sort of a there's a relationship between time of day and things like that as well. So, so so watering does provide a cooling benefit, but under certain circumstances, it there can also be other effects. So you got just there's just more to it than that. We could provide more detail on that at a later date. So. So my understanding is that the whole question of what specific material gets chosen is going to be a separate kind of conversation with a lot of these factors considered and the cost, yeah, durability, all the safety, heat, all those things. That, Correct. Right. A much more detailed discussion of that will follow, and we certainly will talk um, about some of the solutions to those problems. So... so just to clarify your I position. I said nine You're okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, and the rest, I mean. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to avoid notes. ambiguity, I fully support nine and a half acres. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank, between it's the consultant staff and the advisory group, a lot of great minds put a lot of time into thinking through and balancing a lot of uh, considerations. Uh, having been a parent, uh, in, you know, for a lot of years on sidelines of well-designed fields and poorly designed fields, uh, we would be doing ourselves a huge disservice to undersize the capacity of the field and limit uh, the playability. Uh, you have a chance to do it right, build it right once, and it's worth the investment to do that uh, and not regret undersizing it uh, after the fact. Uh, so again, I fully support nine and a half acres. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, everybody said the same thing here, which is thanks uh, to the staff, the consultants, and to uh, approve for your committee. Uh, it doesn't go without saying that uh, it's been a great uh, partnership and, and uh, collaborative effort. And I was thinking about it earlier, when you think about the assets of the community, we talked about the beach and, and uh, open lands. And we nurture the beach because it's such an asset, and we nurture uh, open lands because of what it represents. And this is another opportunity to add a significant asset to the community. Um, and the beach is a public one, open lands is a private one. So maybe there's some options there that we can build on. So uh, as you remember, I had originally said I would be interested in an eight acre um, solution, but I'm convinced that the work that you've done on this, that the nine and a half acres is the right one and for all the reasons that people have talked about. So I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Alderman Novit. Thank you, everybody. As everyone else has said, mm -hmm. thank you for all the work that went into this proposal. I was not on the board when all these decisions were being made. So I'm coming into this new and I'm fine with the nine and a half acre because as everyone else has said, better to overbuild in this case than underbuild. Um, the material, I trust you guys to pick out the right stuff. And uh, the conceptual vision plan is probably the thing I'm most interested in, Drew. I like all those bells and whistles, and I think adding bells and whistles will make this a community park, which is also advised by the group. Well, thank you, that's a pretty clear 
direction, I think. It's about as clear as I've ever heard. So without a, a vote, without an official vote. So um, I, I'll add to uh, what everybody else has said briefly. Um, if you look at the roster of the people and the backgrounds of the people that were on, the, and, and hopefully will still be on the advisory board or advisory committee, uh, because I, I too would like to see the conceptual vision plan, you know, the long range concept plan updated for some of the, you know, as new information becomes available. Um, it's an extraordinary collection of people who are real, real experts in some critical aspect of this, every one of them, and they all donated their time uh, they all work together uh, with a very large group of very capable and experienced city staff and, and a very strong consulting team. And it really, it really shows, and I think this project is going in a great direction. So, so thanks to everybody uh, for all that um, and, and for uh, getting us to this point. So uh, that concludes, oh, other than uh, additional items for discussion and comments by council members, or is there any other comment that any council member would like to make about anything? Okay. Uh, well, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. <laughs> all right. Progress is being made. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. Okay.